Um, I'm going to go ahead and start here. Um, I think this is going to end up being real. So let's go ahead and get started here. So uh, like I was saying, I just had a few things that might be relatively short. Um, I'm actually kind of uh, feeling a little bit under the weather. I probably shouldn't have come in here. I'm glad actually I didn't end up having anybody come in face to face, at least not yet here. So we'll see. So um, as usual, I was planning on saying a little bit about the problem set that we just completed um, and talk about the next problem set, our last one. Um, and then um, also I might uh, say a few words about the final test two and maybe a few thoughts about the end of the class wrap up stuff. So um, as usual, you know, if anybody has any questions, um, you know, email me or, you know, if you're here live, go ahead and uh, send it up in the chat or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, let, let's, let's just get the problem set 12, um, talk about that first, because uh, I don't have a whole lot to say about this. You know, there, there weren't quite as many questions here as we've had in some of the problem sets. Um, I think only one or two people had an issue with with the first two questions. Most of that seemed to be just misreading or misunderstanding the um, uh, the, the setup for the question, right? So, I mean, I was expecting for the first one, a, a relatively simple diet timing diagram, but, um, you know, you had to use a two-stage pipeline. So some people had like three stages for some reason or whatever, but yeah, with a two-stage pipeline, it should just look something like that. It should just take five actual clock cycles to, to run all four instructions, right? And likewise, for the second one, I thought this was relatively straightforward. I think everybody except for one or maybe two people pretty much had this. There, there was one variation that accepted because the, the textbook had a similar thing where um, these stages may or may not be executed when the um, um, when you get to the branch instruction. So, so there could be some argument for some slight variation here, but, but something similar to this was what I was looking for where instruction three branched to some other instruction, to, to the seventh instruction. I just called that instruction seven, but this could have been something, you know, further on or even before instruction one. So like a negative offset, but. Um, but if you did the time, timing diagram for this one for problem set 12, uh, you know, this is the, um, the, the branch penalty here. Uh, an example of that, right? So, you know, uh, these seven instructions take much more than eight cycles to complete because of this branch. And we, we actually weren't able to use, we did, we, we calculated some work here, but we weren't able to actually use this, right? This ends up getting thrown away. Uh, once we resolve that we have to do a, a conditional branch in, to instruction seven that I showed here instead of instruction four, right? So we, we don't use this work and we have to restart the pipeline here, right? Um, these seven instructions actually took 10 cycles instead of potentially they could have been done in um, um, eight cycles, right? So um, anyway, like I said, most people had all that those things. So I want to talk more about uh, three and four, although these were a little bit call outs to a pretty early, you know, so about like the third or fourth chapter was where we had some questions about calculating, um, you know, the millions of instructions per second and throughput and stuff like that. And um, 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 Amdahl's law for speed up and things like that, right? So it was reintroduced uh, in the context of, of the uh, processor structure and function. So, so um, most people got the speed up correct for three, right? And, and for all of these, 
I mean, you almost really don't need to, you know, the, the, the complicated formula, right? So, so the formula, the formula for speed up in general is always the, um, uh, the speed up is going to be the um, unimproved. The, it's, it's really just the ratio between um, the time for the unimproved version divided by the time for the improved version, right? That, that's really all, all that Amdahl's law is, right? So if you correctly calculate the time uh, for those two things, you can get the speed up, okay? Now, there's some shortcuts that our textbook did here because uh, for a lot of these problems, if you're just going from the same CPU architecture, but you're adding in pipelining, the um, the, 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 the tau, this was a, a variable called tau here, which is really the amount of time that each clock cycle takes, which is going to be one over the clock rate, right? So um, the clock rate is 2.5 gigahertz. Um, so that was actually a little bit incorrect here. I need to correct that. So, so I mean, tau is really the, the um, uh, one over your clock rate, right? So, so that's really a measure of, of how much each clock cycle takes, right? So 2.5 gig, another thing, a few people were maybe confusing gigahertz with megahertz, right? Not too many, but but some, right? So I mean, a gigahertz is 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 not millions of cycles per second, but it's billions of cycles per second. So that's it's not ten to the sixth, but it's ten to the ninth, right? So here tau is going to be this value, one over two point five times ten to the ninth, right? But if you're using the same CPU architecture, you're just adding. In this case, we're just adding a five stage pipeline, right? Uh, the, 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 um, the amount of time for the clock rates is going to cancel out. So you can really just calculate the speed up as uh, n times k, where n is the total number of instructions you're going to execute. Um, and um, um, or, well, um, and, and K is the um, um, the number of cycles that each instruction takes, right? So the the short, you know, the the shorthand of that is that every instruction, if, if we don't have any pipeline, which was the unimproved version here. It's five clock cycles, right? So we're actually going to take this is really a count of the number of clock cycles. And then if you have the time for each clock cycle, that would be the total time for the um, unpipeline version, right? Um, and here, you know, as we talked about a little bit last week, though, if you're pipelining, um, if you kind of ignore branches and data dependencies and other complications, you effectively end up being able to execute one instruction every clock cycle with um, a little bit of overhead in order to load the pipeline. Okay, so that's really what the K plus N minus one is, right? So really um, the number of instructions um, minus one plus K ends up being the number of clock cycles you need, okay? but. I mean, you know, you, you almost really don't need this complicated version because if the number of instructions is large and you're ignoring the effects of jumps and things, the, this effectively, you know, n minus one is n is much, much, much larger. This is millions. This is much, much larger than the size of the pipeline. So you can effectively ignore k and the minus one, right? So, I mean, effectively, it, it's saying that uh, it's only going to take um, 1.5 million clock cycles, to, you know, we're, we're, or we're going to execute one instruction every clock cycle. That, that's really all the same with just a little bit of difference there, right? Uh, in fact, I, I, in my answer, I didn't even show this, but um, um, so, you know, it's really 4.99999 to like, I think it was like four or five digits before you get to a non-nine value here. 
So the speed up is, is effectively five, okay? So whenever you're using a pipeline uh, for the assumptions that we've talked about in our textbook, um, the assumptions being that we can break it up into a number of steps and we can execute the steps in, in parallel. And if we're mostly ignoring the effects of like branching or data dependencies, um, you know, except for the, the, the overhead of having to load the pipeline, we're effectively getting one instruction. Once we've got the pipeline loaded, we're getting one instruction finished every clock cycle, right? So we have a little bit of overhead, but, but you know, here we get one instruction every cycle finished after we get the pipeline loaded, right? This assembly line, okay? And, you know, to be exact, I mean, um, some people had, um, most, most people had this correct, this one, right? So this is essentially five or really close to it, 4.999 and something, right? And the bigger the number of instructions, you know, this, this, I mean, essentially when you have more than a couple hundred instructions, you're gonna end up getting that theoretical speed up. Um, again, if you're ignoring jump, if you're ignoring ignoring the penalty that occurs uh, because of um, the interruption to the pipeline for, for different reasons, right? Um, but you know these expressions. Um, so I'm, I'm going into this because for the for the fourth question, you can't really ignore the tau because the CPUs were slightly different. They had slightly different um, clock rates. So the, the tau was different. So, so you couldn't, like this, you couldn't ignore the, the tau in question four, right? So, I mean, you know, we're not exactly ignoring the tau. We could have also multiplied these by um, the, the, the clock cycle rate. That would give us the, the amount of time that it took for the unimproved. And then this would, that expression times tau is the amount of time um, the you know the total actual real clock, real wall time that would pass um, for if you have the pipeline version right but you know because that um, because how is the same for both of these um, those kind of cancel out and it's really so the the effective speed up that we're interested in is really just a function of this times the improvement that you get from the pipeline. And because the improvement that you get from the pipeline allows you to effectively approach one instruction being um, executed every clock cycle. Um, so, you know, again, you know, normally um, for the unpipeline version, and, and if it takes five cycles to complete one typical instruction, but now for the pipeline, the pipeline version, we're in, we're executing one instruction every cycle. The effective speed up is fine. All right. So, but a lot of people um, got the uh, the throughput or the you know the. Um, um, speed in millions of the, 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 the millions of instructions per second that could be executed um, incorrect here. So now that I think about it, a lot of people maybe were doing this. Um, and so, 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 so some students um, weren't giving me the actual MIPS, you know, were giving me something in like instructions in uh, microseconds or something like that, right? So, you know, Although I probably didn't give you a zero for that, but but you know, if I ask for MIPS, you should really give what's asked for for these problems. But the other thing is that um, this really shouldn't be too tough to figure out. So for the um, um, for the original processor that's unimproved that has a two point five gigahertz clock rate, but it executes an instruction every five cycles. You, you effectively have to divide that by five, okay? Because we get one instruction every five cycles. So if you divide that by five, 
um, you know, that 2.5 gigahertz is 2,500 megahertz. You have to multiply by 1,000. If you divide by five, that's 500 megahertz, right? But you're, it's 500 cycles per second, and you're um, executing one instruction every one of those um, um, 500 million cycles per second. 500 megahertz would be 500 million cycles per second, okay? So for the unimproved version, if you divide by five, you get, um, 500 MIPS, right? So effectively, um, we can, you know, again, ignoring, no, not ignoring branches in this case. So, so for the for the non-pipeline version, branching stuff doesn't uh, affect the performance rating, right? So you, you'd effectively, though, be getting 500 million instructions per second executed, right? Uh, but for the improved version, again, you know, we're getting effectively one instruction executed um, every clock cycle, right? So it's 2.5 gigahertz, that's 2,500 megahertz. Um, so that's effectively, effectively 2,500 MIPS, 2,500 million instructions per second, okay? This, this one, um, Though you know that is in theory, so in practice, um, that could be quite a bit lower. Again, depending on the percentage of branching and the percentage of data dependencies that cause um, pipeline, you know, uh, the, the pipeline penalties. You know, pipelines having to be restarted, right? So you know. Effectively, um, this is going to be some percentage of that, depending on you know what your code looks like that's being executed, um, how much dependencies it has in it, and how many branches and things it has in it. So, um, okay, but then for some reason that um, I mean, I, I think. When I looked over it, um, the, the the biggest problem, but people were getting the 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 MIPS correct for from four, but weren't getting the the um, the speed up correct, right? And I think that that was basically because the the the, the most basic problem was that um, again people were treating this as if uh, the time for each clock cycle was equal. Right, um, and also people were just plugging in um, like a hundred instructions as the the program size or something like that. So you, maybe you should have used a little bit of a bigger value. Uh, but um, in this case, that I mean the the the, uh, the time for each clock cycle is different, so you can't ignore that. You're gonna have to actually calculate time. Uh, the, the total time for the unimproved versus the improved in order to get the correct speed up, okay? So this is what I got um, as the answer for this one. Um, so for when you only have um, a no pipeline, right? So one means uh, here, tau one means that um, 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 uh, in the original, we're giving uh, that we have a 2.5 gigahertz clock, so that's 2.5 tenths in the ninth, but it takes four um, um, cycles per instruction, okay? So that means tau is going to be four divided by um, the um, clock rate, right? Or the tau for the unimproved version, right? But the tau for the pipeline um, processor, uh, the, the, the um, um, clock rate had to be reduced for whatever reason here, right? To two gigahertz, right? But effectively, uh, we assume um, by, by all the assumptions for this chapter that we're getting one instruction uh, every one of those clock cycles, right? So it's going to be one over the two gigahertz for our, our tau here, right? So then
So then, you know, again, you could have assumed like, you know, 1.5 million instructions or things like that, right? But it would have had to have been equal. So if I go back to this previous one, um, if n is large enough, you can pretty much, again, kind of get rid of, of all of, of, of these. And it's, to, it's really just uh, n times k times tau, right? Um, but we already we already calculated using k of four before, so it's really just uh, the number of instructions times tau divided by the number of instructions times tau here, where we've got the two different tau's that we just calculated. And of course, the n then can cancel out. So really, to calculate the speed up, all you need to know is the the, the tau, the, the the amount of time that it takes. Um, on average, or usually to um, finish one instruction for each of the two um, architectures, or the, the two variations of the CPU that we have here, right? You know, that will give you the limit. As n gets larger and larger, that will give you the limit of what the speed up is, all right? So that, that was kind of what I was saying here, right? So really, all you have to do is divide those two tau's that I gave by each other, right? And you should get something like, I mean, you should get 3.2 in that case, right? Um, because like I said, you know, the 10 to the ninth cancels out. Um, so this divided by that is the same as is this times the inverse of that. Um, the 10 to the ninth cancels out. So you get eight over 2.5, which is 3.2, right? And here, kind of as I said in my announcement, um, you know, this should have been kind of a check here. So, so for example, the speed up was five here on the previous one, um, and I didn't ask people to calculate this, but you know, I said that that you know we're effectively getting twenty five hundred MIPS on the improved version and five hundred MIPS for the non pipeline version. So that's that that matches the speed up that we have. That, that's a five times uh, speed up. Thing. Um, but in this case, you have to put the um, uh, you know the number of mints on top, right? But but um, 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 there's a one to five ratio there, right? Same thing should happen here. So so you know this should have been a check if you understood what was. The relationship between the the throughput um, and the speed up that you were supposed to be calculating, right? So um, I, you know to calculate the MIPS uh, millions of instructions per second. Uh, again, uh, more people had this correct on the second part, even though they were missing it on the first part for some reason. Um, but for the un unimproved one, um, If, if this is our clock rate, but we're in X, but we're completing one instruction every four of those rate, you have to divide that by four to get the MIPS, right? So that gives you 6, 0.625 times 10 to the ninth um, or 625 times 10 to the sixth. So that's 625 MIPS, uh, millions of instruction per second that the um, non-pipeline version gives you, right? But um, again, we're effectively getting one instruction every clock cycle, but um, we're running at two gigahertz, which is 2000 megahertz or, so, or 2000 million instructions per second for the uh, improved um, version, right? But the, again, the ratio of those um, should match the speed up that you get, right? So if my improved version is 2000, um, and the um, non-pipeline version is 625. If you divide those, that should give you the same speed up that you would get if you calculate the time um, you know, the ratio between the unimproved and the improved time um, to execute some number of instructions, like you were supposed to be doing for A. Okay. So, you know, kind of to summarize that, um, I mean, there, there's a little bit there um, that, 
because people got this wrong, you know, didn't have the, 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 the answer here for MIPS that would imply the same speed up. It's, it's just an indication to me that, um, you know, um, people don't fully connect these things yet, right? So um, um, that, that's always, you know, um, um, a good indication of whether you're getting all of the, the details or not. Uh, when, when there's simple kind of rules of thumbs or checks like this that you kind of ought to recognize, but, but people aren't, that, that, that would clue you in to, that something's wrong when you did your calculations here, right? So in this case, um, the relationship of the throughput should be the same as, you know, the speed up calculations, right? Then, so you should have the same ratio in both cases. Um, okay, anyway, so that, that was kind of all I had to say about 12, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, most people did fine on that, on, on, on the problems at 12. Um, if you guys have any further questions about those, you know, let me know, send me emails or, or whatever. Um, if you want to ask something more specific than what we covered here. But, um, um, all right, so like I said, um, let me talk, I, I, I don't think I'm gonna really talk a lot then. Uh, let me just look at the, the last final problem set that we have um, here on the um, chapter 17, I guess it was, on reduced instruction set computer. Um, so I, I didn't give a whole lot of problems here to do. Uh, the first one is in reference to the figure 17.6a, right? So, uh, which was down in like section five here. Oops. Um, it was this figure here, right? So all, all I'm asking for are um, Is is a um, expression similar to this, but for the two stage, three stage, and four stage pipeline, right? Um, and you might have to use you know J as well as the N and D. So so the N is the number of executed instructions, which um, is uh, differs slightly because of the no ops here, right? But but um, um, so, you know, we had, uh, we had five executed instructions for A here, right? And, and basically that, that's a count of the number of, of machine cycles. So if, if you add two times five, so, so for the, the um, sequential execution with two stages here, we have a, um, um, what was it? The fetch, which they called I for some reason instead of F, so the, the fetch and then the execute. Um, and then um, um, a possible third stage. So, so any uh, instruction that needed a, um, um, a load or a store um, also had to do a, um, a memory access, right? So if, if it's non-pipelined, um, basically it's gonna be two times the number of instructions plus the, the, the number of uh, memory accesses that were required. So that's all that, all that's being said here, right? So you should be able to give similar um, formulas uh, for the, the two stage, three stage and four stage pipelining um, where you might potentially need to add in um, the, uh, the J here as well. Right, so there's a branch instruction here that um, you, know, you can kind of see the effects. It, it can cause sometimes um, for um, uh, 
potentially, you know, uh, for some of these to need to be delayed. So. Um, I mean, you should understand. I mean, you know, for the, the two stage pipeline, um, we can only ever have two things going uh, in parallel, right? Because we've only got two stages on the, on the pipeline here, right? Um, so I guess they're implying that uh, the execute and the fetch always have to be the things that happen in parallel, and that the um, uh, the memory access then has to happen um, uh, without anything else occurring um, at the same time that it does. But if we have three stages, um, the uh, memory access can be happening in parallel with both the fetch and the execute, right? And so it looks a little bit cleaner here, right? Um, and so on. Um, okay, so that was the first question. There's only three questions on this one. So we just ask for the second one to reorganize the um, the code on um, or the, the same one, uh, sorry, the, the 17.6D in order to reduce these no ops. Okay, so our textbook talks a little bit about that. So there, so there might be a way to um, reorder some of these so that we don't need like all four of these no-ops here. So, um, that's what's talked about there. Um, and then finally, there's an example of some code that has been compiled down to like a, a CISC complex instruction set, computer x86 uh, assembly. So um, I guess uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm kind of still looking for kind of the same assembly, but um, 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 you know, like like x86 level, but but replace using the integer multiply uh, with some more basic uh, instructions here. Anyway, so that's what was asked for kind of for these three questions here. Um, all right, so yeah, the, the, the chapter 17, you know, is about um, um, uh, reduced instruction set computers, right? So we've run into risk versus CISC uh, a few times before. Um, so these are kind of more details on um, you know, the, what the trade-offs are, so why CISC versus RISC, you know, and what the arguments are for why one might be better than the other. In general, um, I mean, a lot of the general purpose computers, servers and things, um, uh, Intel-based systems and AMD systems are kind of, uh, the, the, the Intel CPUs are CISC, considered to be complex instruction set computers, right? But uh, the ARM computers, which, which are uh, the, the most popular examples of kind of risk computers um, that are being used today. So there's a little bit of some historical things like, like Spark and stuff that aren't used, but, but ARM computers, uh, ARM chips um, have kind of really, I mean, they, they are making their way into the server market as a niche, but uh, but really down at like the mobile devices and stuff, you know, so your Snapdragon processors on your phones and things like that are, are a lot, most all of those are kind of um, 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 uh, risk-based um, ARM chips. So, so it's, it's, um, it's unclear to me whether that's uh, kind of a fundamental divide, you know, whether, whether there's some reason why kind of smaller mobile devices are more naturally uh, risk-based, whereas servers um, are, are cis-based, right? and then, you know, it's not completely cleanly cut, you know, so like I said, there are um, 
a small, some percentage of servers that do use ARM-based chips and things. So you see things like that out there. So. Um, anyway, so that, that's our last chapter. I mean, I, I had kind of originally had um, plans to cover chapter 18 as well. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. If you, if you get a chance, I think I mentioned this before, try and read over it, especially like the superscalar processors and things. So. Um, but um, at this point, once you get done with the assignment 13 and the quiz 13, um, you've completed everything except for our final test two. Okay, so um, I've set like a due date on te test two has kind of the same format as test one. Let me talk a little bit about test two here. Um, um, so, you know, it's, it's online, uh, it, it does have a time limit, uh, but you take it through online through our, you know, D2L course shell. Um, it is due, so, so you have to start it and take it before um, December 17th, which is the Friday at the end of finals week, right? So I, I gave you some time on that, but um, um, when did I open it up? Um, yeah, so I, I opened up for quite a bit of time, um, and I guess that's fine. Nobody, nobody's asked about it uh, yet. So like, currently, I have it open starting on Friday, right? So, so as early as this Friday, um, you know, even before the the last problem set is due, you could go ahead and get started on it. Um, but um, so whatever, I guess I did that just so that whatever, you know. Uh, whatever time works best for you in kind of the, the last, all the finals week uh, that you can set aside to concentrate on and work on the test. Um, uh, you can go ahead and do that, right? So, but yeah, it is open for a full week, um, but you know, it's, it's the same kind of format as the, the first one. Um, so once you start it, uh, there will be a time limit and, and you have to complete the questions um, and submit them. The, 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 the format is the same. So there are some multiple choice true false questions again, like your quiz questions, but the real heart of the test and most of the points are the, the longer format questions. Um, um, these are again, mostly like um, comprehensive exam questions. Okay. So I've used questions that we've, that were similar to com comprehensive exam questions for our computer architecture course that we've done in the past. So, so I wanted this to be an opportunity to see and practice doing stuff on the comprehensive exam. Um, they are more, more focused on, um, you know, the materials after the first test. So um, I think there's a question um, on, um, on computer arithmetic or something like that, or maybe on um, um, uh, uh, the representation of, I can't remember exactly. So, so like maybe the, the multiply algorithm or um, representing numbers as floating point things. I guess one of the questions, just as an example, I think there's a question uh, concerning pipelines and stuff kind of similar to the materials we're doing right now in this chapter, and then there's a third one, so. Um, all right, so, you know, my advice would be, you know, uh, you could certainly kind of review back on your quiz questions if, if you want to for that first part, but, but the best thing to do would be to look at the problem sets, go back and look at the problem sets. And if you have to, you know, concentrate on the problem sets um, from uh, problem set eight onwards, uh, you know, computer arithmetic, digital logic, um, uh, instruction sets, assembly language, um, those types of things. So, so kind of review those, review the example solutions and, and your own work and stuff like that it would be a good review for the test too.
Um, all right. So that was kind of really all I had, all I had to say on this and, and on the final problem set and on the test. You know, um, if people have questions on those, email me. Um, so just some general thought. I mean, I was looking through kind of where people stand on the grades and stuff. So, you know, so I know uh, there was lots of problems and work on this course, but, but most people um, ended up in pretty fine shape. I still have questions about uh, a lot of work. So, you know, I can't really tell um, how much work was coming from in, in lots of cases was was individual effort versus uh, group effort right so i've got things that i need to do to redesign but that's always kind of a challenge for online courses like this you know so on the one case you know i don't i, I certainly don't mind um and and would like to give opportunities for people to work together and learn together but in the other case you know um, um we've got certain requirements and things where we do have to get some evaluations of individuals and and how that they understood um you know how well they mastered the material right so um i was gonna say if, if people have suggestions on things yeah so what I usually try to do is, is, or what I think I need to do more of is try and give things that um, are much more lower stakes um, and, 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 and try and do something um, uh, so that when I want individual assessments, you know, individual work. So, so not working with other people, but, but, but doing your own work. Um, so I can get a better feel for uh, how people are doing you know, one by one instead of um, um, relying on, uh, on on other people's understanding to get by on things, right? So I suppose the other thing is that, uh, you know, um, this isn't an online course. So, you know, um, whenever it's not an online course, I might have to go back and um, um, do at least a few assessments face-to-face so that uh, we can ensure that, that we get some things that are completely uh, individual students working on them. So anyway, th so I mean, those are some of the things that I'm thinking about. Uh, but um, I've, I've been trying to get these courses to be a little bit more um, doable uh, through online effort, right? But but we still, I, I still haven't kind of cracked that problem though, that um, uh, not everything can be like a group assignment um, um, we really need to get it uh, some kinds of, of assessment evaluation materials um, um, that that show just what one individual student knows you know so anyway um, overall though i mean you know i'm getting back to the the main point uh, i mean most people are are fine i mean there, there's still like 23 points left so you know potentially if you got 90 percent of those 23 points which would be about 20 points or so and added that on to the number of points you have now that gives you an idea of where you would be most people if, if i add 20 points on everybody's points um uh, uh you know only maybe only a few people end up above the 90 threshold, but almost everybody ends up above the, the, the 80 threshold. So um, um, I'll probably shift that a little bit. We'll see, you know, so I, I think most people did do fine. Um, um, so I might shift that down, see, see what kind of, what the maximum point was for the best student. Uh, and, and kind of shift down for that to be more like the the the, the upper range um, for students here. So. But you know, to wrap up, I mean, some of the things that uh, most everybody except for three or four people did do all the assignments, and that goes a long way with me. I mean, we're submitting the assignments, right? Um, we're doing the work. Um. um Things like this, especially graduate level classes, 
really, you really need to do practice, right? So, so, so you really need to see lots and lots of different questions or different problems in the subject area um, uh, to, to, to really deeply understand the subject, right? And that's kind of what the goal is of a graduate level course is to go beyond um, surface level of things and to get deep or, or a deep understanding at least of, of some aspects of the topic. So, so that's kind of why I've been playing around with um, uh, at least a problem set every week and, and a quiz, right? So still looking for better materials for this class, um, but um, we'll see. I, I, I'm probably gonna try and get in some programs, um, um, although I don't want, want them to be just um, um, assembly language programs, um, which would be a lot of overlap with um, um, a, a, another course that we have. So. All right, um, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and end the session here. Um, so I hope, hope everybody did find the materials useful. Um, and uh, also, you know, just as a practical thing, I hope everybody has gotten some ideas, some practice for like comprehensive exam, right? So, so you know, um, the questions you're getting here will be similar to what you should be seeing for the 540 questions for the comprehensive exam and, and in general for the other core courses, right? So um, um, hopefully that was useful as well. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and end the session here um, and uh, uh, you know, good luck on your semester um, and I will um, talk to you guys later then.